Hi, this is Raj Mehta, and I'm going to be doing a brief review of acid-base disorders. The value of acid-base disorders, like any clinical symptom or sign you might see, is that you can use the information to determine the underlying disease or etiology of your patient's ongoing problems. The best way to approach acid-base disorders is to take a systematic approach. Before I show you the one that I find very helpful, I think it's worthwhile to review some basics on acid-base homeostasis in the human body. The formula at the top here in yellow is a basic chemistry or balance that you have in your human body between CO2 and water that forms carbonic acid, and which splits up into bicarbonate and hydrogen ion, and the hydrogen ion is what determines your pH. Of this formula, the most important variables that you need to know is your CO2, or your carbon dioxide, and your HCO3, or your bicarbonate. The reason is, is because physiologically, these are the two variables that are changed in acid-base disorders. CO2 is controlled by the lungs, or respiration, and respiratory disorders primarily affect CO2 to cause acid-base disorders. On the other hand, bicarbonate is controlled by the kidneys, and primarily metabolic disorders change your bicarbonate value to cause acid-base disorders. Now, it's important to know the normal values for CO2 and bicarbonate. The normal CO2 value is around 40, and the normal bicarbonate value is around 24. Having these values memorized will allow you to easily recognize when these values are incorrect or abnormally elevated or lower, and to recognize different primary processes in acid-base disorders. Let's get this started in recognizing or evaluating a patient or a clinical situation with acid-base problems. The first step is of course to recognize if your patient is actually having an acid-base problem because not all diseases will cause acid-base disturbances. The most common way that I find uh, clinically I, uh, or I, the most common way I recognize acid-base disturbances is to look at serum chemistries because most patients will have a Chem 7 or a serum chemistry. And if you have an abnormally elevated or abnormally low bicarbonate value, then that's a pretty good indication that you're usually having some kind of acid-base problem. Similarly, if you have an anion gap in your serum chemistry, an anion gap is calculated by sodium minus a combination of chloride and bicarbonate. If you have an anion gap greater than 10, that usually lets you know you have an acid-base problem. Conversely, if you have an arterial blood gas value for any reason, and uh, that ABG will then let me look at the pH uh, and find out quite obviously if there is an uh, acid-base disturbance. On the left, on the green, I have kind of outlined a stepwise process that I like to take that systematically allows me to analyze every acid-base disorder. The first step is look at your pH and determine if you're having an acidosis or an alkalosis. And usually, the human body, the normal pH is about 7.44. And in acidosis, your value is usually be below 7.36. And in alkalosis, it's usually about above 7.44. In between there is pretty much considered normal. The second step is to determine the primary process. Is this some kind of respiratory or metabolic alkalosis or acidosis? Um, the third step is then to use different clues or lab values to kind of narrow down your differential and what you think is going on. Now these first three steps are nice because you can just kind of glance at the values and mentally go through the process. The fourth step is a little bit more challenging. It requires you to do a little bit more analytics to determine if your primary process is having appropriate compensation. And uh, I'll go through that step when we reach it. And finally, at the very end, we take all our data together and try and figure out what we think is our diagnosis, or at very least, we make a very narrow differential on what we think is going wrong with uh, our, our particular patient, our clinical scenario. So let's walk through our step process. The very first thing is we need to get an ABG and determine our pH. And we've done step number one. Great. What about step number two? Determining the primary process allows requires you to look at some patterns. And you need to know three things. You need to know your PCO2 values, your bicarbonate values, and your pH to know if you have an acidosis or an alkalosis. So in a patient who has an acidosis, let us say, and you have a primarily low or decreased bicarbonate and a compensatory change in your PCO2, those low values suggest you're having a metabolic acidosis. On the other hand, if you're having an elevated CO2 and an acid uh, 
alkyl acidemia pitcher and a compensatory increase in your bicarbonate, that suggests you're having a respiratory acidosis. And then on alkalosis increasing bicarbonate and a compensatory increase in your CO2 is a metabolic alkalosis and a decrease in your CO2 and a compensatory sorry that was incre incorrect, a compensatory decrease in your bicarbonate suggests a respiratory alkalosis. And now in this determining your primary process what I'm s implying is that you probably have some simple or just one single underlying process going on. It's possible you could be having a mixed picture, you can ha be having multiple things going on and that gets a little bit more complicated and so if the pattern that you're seeing doesn't follow this exact picture then you kind of have a sense that maybe you have a mixed picture you have a mixed process going on. But for the most part, you can look at your CO2, your bicarbonate, and your pH, and at a glance kind of figure out what your primary process is. Your third step is looking at clues. And what you're attempting to do here is you're trying to narrow your differential down once you know your underlying primary process. An example is, let's say, you, know, you think your patient is having a metabolic acidosis based on step number two. Well, the first thing you want to do is you want to look at your anion gap. If you have a normal anion gap, then you know you have a normal anion gap metabolic acidosis, and that has one list of differentials as a problem. But if you have a high anion gap, then you know that not only do you have a metabolic acidosis, because only an anion gap can cause a metabolic acidosis, but there's only a specific number of things that can cause that. Another clue I like looking at is sugars. If you have a patient with hyperglycemia and you have ketones in your urine, there's a pretty good chance that patient's undergoing DKA. Checking a lactic acid value is also helpful. An elevated lactic acid, usually from some process such as sepsis, coincides with metabolic acidosis. I like looking at your sodium and chloride values in your chemistry, because so a low sodium, with or without a low chloride, is usually part of a contraction alkalosis, or metabolic alkalosis from low volume. An elevated creatinine value with an elevated BUN is very common in renal failure. And on and on. You can take other elements from your history, like if you have a patient with diarrhea. Then clinically, that might explain why your patient is having a non-anion gap metabolic acidosis. One caveat to keep in mind is whenever you are calculating your anion gap, which formula I've again put out here, make sure you correct for albumin. Uh, anion gaps greater than 10 in play of a normal albumin, and if you have a lower albumin, usually every one less than four, you have to correct for it by increasing or adding 2.5 to your anion gap calculations. The fourth step uh, in our systematic approach is determining compensation. And what you're trying to do here is you're trying to see if the appropriate change in your metabolic or respiratory process is having an appropriate uh, equilibrium uh, in your body. And if you're not having a normal process going on, or if it's not adding up, it can kind of give you a clue that you may be having a mixed process in addition to a single process. The easy way to determine if you're having appropriate compensation is just to look at a nomogram. If you know your pH, which is down here on these values, and you know your bicarbonate value on the left axis here, and then up here if you can determine your PCO2 values, then you can look on your nomogram and determine if you're in the right place or if you have a mixed process going on. So in a patient with a PCO2 of 60, a bicarbonate of 30, and a pH of 7.35, I find my CO2 of 60 and I come down here. And that correlates to a bicarbonate of 30 around here. And I draw a little marker there. And that also correlates to a pH of about 7.35. So my patient is in this spot in the nomogram and that can either imply they're having a chronic respiratory acidosis, which might be just a single process, or they could have a mixed process with a respiratory acidosis and a mixed metabolic alkalosis. So nomogram is an easy way to do compensation changes. For purists, uh, the appropriate mathematical analytical way to do compensation is to, to take out a pen and paper and actually do the mathematical changes itself. Um, let's take in our example a metabolic acidosis. Well, in a metabolic acidemia, you have a change in your bicarbonate, and within minutes, I would expect a compensatory change in your lungs or your CO2 value. In this example, for every one decrease in your bicarbonate in a metabolic acidosis, you would have about a compensatory change of a decrease of about 1.3 in your PCO2. So if I was going to give an example, if I had a patient with a bicarbonate of 14, that's about 10 less than 24, which is your normal bicarbonate value.
then I would expect a decrease in my CO2 value of about 13. So if normal CO2 is 40, then that decrease would give me a CO2 of about 27. And this is this value right here holds true for pretty much any metabolic acidosis process. This is what you expect to find. And you can use this whole chart to go through and do your calculations for metabolic alkalemia and similarly for respiratory acidosis and alkalosis. Now with respiratory acidosis and alkalosis, you can have acute and chronic changes. The reason is because it can take about 12 to 24 hours before you'll have a compensatory change. And if it's an acute ongoing process, that compensation may not happen all the way. So if in acute respiratory acidosis, if your PCO2 goes up by a value of about 10, your bicarbonate will only go up by a value of about 1. But once you have a chronic respiratory acidosis and your your body has appropriately gotten used to dealing with it, then a PCO2 increase of about 10 will cause your bicarbonate to increase about 4. So doing compensation requires you to know uh, all the values that I've kind of written here, which is kind of a rough guide. And additionally, it requires you to know your clinical history to determine if you're having an acute or chronic process. The second part about doing a compensatory calculation is you have to calculate your delta gap. Anytime you have a patient with an anion gap metabolic acidosis, you have to calculate your delta gap to find out if the anion gap process is uh, purely a metabolic anion gap acidosis or if you have some other mixed process going on. The anion the delta gap is calculated by taking your anion gap and subtracting 10 and taking your bicarbonate value and subtracting 24. Essentially what you're trying to do is you're trying to find out the change in your anion gap because a normal anion gap is 10. So if a patient has an anion gap of 20, that change value would be about 10 more than you expect. And similarly, you want to find out your change in your bicarbonate because if our same patient has a bicarbonate of 14, that's 10 away from what we'd expect the value of 24, and that change value is 10 then dividing those two numbers will give you a value, which is your delta gap. Now, a delta gap of 1 is normal. If you have a delta gap greater than 1, that suggests you have a metabolic acidosis in addition to your anion gap acidosis. And if your delta gap is less than 1, that implies you have a metabolic alkalosis in addition to your uh, anion gap acidosis. Once you finish step 4 and correctly concluded if you're having an appropriate compensation or not and finding out if you have a single or a mixed picture of acid-base disorders. Then we go through and determine what our diagnosis or our differential is based on the acid disorder we've identified. The first step is, of course, we check the pH based on our ABG. And if our value is less than 7.36, we can successfully diagnose our acidemia. If it's greater than 744, then we can say, OK, we're having an alkalosis picture. Now I'm going to go through our alkalemia first. Alkalemias can be broken up into respiratory or metabolic alkalosis. A respiratory alkalosis is identified with a PCO2 of less than 40, and that makes sense because what you're going to be basically having is hyperventilation. You're going to be blowing off a lot of CO2. Your CO2 value is going to be low. You're going to have an alkalosis. Another common cause of respiratory alkalosis is aspirin ingestion, something that's very important to recognize, and a serum aspirin level will help you identify and diagnose that. On the other side of our picture here, we have metabolic alkalosis, and that corresponds to an elevated bicarbonate value. That would be greater than 24. And usually you have two kinds of causes of this, and we break them up into saline responsive or saline resistant. Uh, saline responsive usually implies you're having some kind of volume loss. Either you're having diarrhea or you've been on diuretics like Lasix or HCTZ or post-hypercapnia is a common cause of this, and you have some volume contraction. And you can diagnose this because you have a urine chloride less than 20 because you don't have enough volume. And if you give this person normal saline or some kind of volume, your metabolic acidos alkalosis will resolve. The other type of metabolic alkalosis, which is identified with a urine chloride greater than 20, are saline resistant and hyperaldosteronism and antacid ingestion or excessive use of that are common causes. Going back up our tree, let's go to our acidosis sign. So if you've diagnosed someone with having a metabolic acidosis, or let me start over. If you've diagnosed with someone having an acidemia, you're either going to have a metabolic acidosis or a respiratory acidosis. Metabolic acidosis, of course, is a low bicarbonate, and respiratory acidosis is an elevated PCO2. Now, respiratory acidosis is usually the most straightforward. It usually implies your CO2 is high because you're having some hypoventilation, and usually that implies some kind of lung disease. You can have airway obstruction, acute lung disease, chronic lung disease, or you could have some uh, sedative, uh, like opiates or narcotics, which can cause your uh, respiratory depression hyperventilation. Distinguishing between these uh, can be done by calculating an arterial alveolar gradient. It will be normal with sedatives or narcotics and opiates. 
but with any kind of lung disease or obstruction, you'd expect an uh, abnormal elevated uh, alveolar uh, arterial ni uh, a gradient. And also, weak respiratory muscles can cause hypoventilation. If you have someone who's respirating heavily over and over and over, and they finally start to get fatigued, you'll determine that person has respiratory acidosis. And this is a bad sign. These are the types of patients that you might have to intubate, so it's important to look out for that. Uh, on the other side, when we have a uh, metabolic acidosis, uh, we can usually distinguish that between anion gap and non-anion gap. Now, non-anion gap are pretty easy to identify. They're also known as hyperchloremic metabolic acidosis because your chloride is going to be high. And usually you have GI or renal cause of this. GI is usually you just have lots of diarrhea and you're losing bicarbonate in your diarrhea and that's why you have an anion gap. Uh, sorry, that's why you have a acidosis. Uh, and in renal causes of it, usually you have renal tubular acidosis. There's types 1, 2, and 4 uh, and that's causing your acidosis. And urine anion gap calculated by urine sodium plus urine uh, potassium minus urine chloride can distinguish these two if you can't determine it cl clinically. A negative urine anion gap is normal, and that's found in GI causes, and a positive urine anion gap is found in uh, renal causes. Finally, we can look at our anion gap metabolic acidosis, and again, that's uh, an abnormal anion gap greater than 10, because every patient is going to have an anion gap of 10, but higher than that is unusual. And your anion gap metabolic acidosis are caused by things like DKA, starvation, lactic acidosis, renal failure, etc. And mud piles is a, a good mnemonic that people use to sometimes remember common causes of anion gap metabolic acidosis. I hope this has been a useful video to you guys, and I'll see you guys in another video.